Well, welcome everyone. And I, uh, as I've said for the last three weeks, today is our fourth week. We've been absent from each other during worship, and I miss that. I miss seeing your faces. And I also, um, I'm also very much aware that you might think I put on a lot of weight because I know the camera aids at least 15 pounds. Um, but that don't trouble that. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Um, instead, I pray that this message is a blessing to you um, in this time of separation, which I think we're all feeling. The scripture reading that um, is for Palm Sunday, it's about the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. It's contained in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. And as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, and with her a colt. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, tell them that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. And this took place to fulfill what the prophet spoke, saying, Daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, a colt, a foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very loud, large crowd spread their cloaks and their on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds went ahead of him, shouting, following, shouting, Hosanna, son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowd answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in the Galilee. Children sing and they dance and shout. No one can hinder thee. If they won't praise, the rocks cry out. No one can hinder thee. King Jesus done just what he said. No one can hinder thee. He healed the sick and he raised the dead. No one can hinder thee. Right on, King Jesus. No one can hinder thee. Right on, King Jesus. Right on, no one can hinder thee. 
Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity uh, to just be here in this sanctuary of yours, Lord God, that I can also be in many places at once through the power of technology and through the love of, uh, of, of those, Lord, who so desperately want to hear um, a message from you. I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity and for the ability to do so. I pray that everything that I say would be a blessing and would reveal Jesus' presence to the world who so desperately needs it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, once again, church, Jesus has crossed the line in his ministry. Only this time, the line he crosses is an actual physical, physical one. It's the barrier or the invisible line somewhat between the outside world and the city of Jerusalem. But church, this is not the finish line for him. No, that it's just another line in a long line of lines that he has crossed, including the many that he stepped over for the cultural and the religious barriers of his day, from claiming to be the son of God, to touching and healing lepers, to welcoming tax collectors and prostitutes, and confronting the religious rulers about healing on the Sabbath. And worst of all, given the situation that we're currently in, he was actually accused of eating a meal without washing his hands. I, uh, I can just go on, but I'm going to just stop there and name those are just a few of the items of the lines that Jesus crossed during his ministry. Now, this crossing of this particular line into Jerusalem, well, it actually begins with Jesus giving specific orders to his disciples that are actually contained in Zechariah chapter 9. These orders, or this way Jesus wants to come in, speaks volumes to the people that are outside the city of Jerusalem, as well as those who are inside about who he is. He tells his disciples the way he wants to enter into Jerusalem is gently, on a cult, on a cult. He doesn't, he's, he doesn't want to have any grander entrance than to come into Jerusalem in that manner. And, ha and the, the scripture says, and he does so in front of a huge crowd. Many estimate to be well over 100,000 people have lined the entryway into Jerusalem. Many have now removed their cloaks, according to scripture, as well as cut branches down to smooth his path into, in a manner of welcoming Jesus, befitting of a king. But they are not all there. Let's be Let's be honest about that. Not everyone in that crowd is, is there just to worship Jesus or give praise. I'm sure that there were more than a few curiosity seekers who were there because they have heard about the miraculous healings that Jesus has done. And others are there, I'm believing, because of the controversial teachings he's offered that challenge the, the power structures that are part of their world at that time. And possibly, I believe there are some there, who are there out of gratitude for what Jesus has done for them. And this is their way of thanking him as they welcome him in to the city of Jerusalem. And to a person, their voices cry out, Son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And now all that crying out, church, all that basically means is Jesus, save us. Save us, Lord. But now once inside the city, it's important to note, those cries have stopped. They, they've died down to, to next to nothing, if anything. Because to say such a thing now in the city of Jerusalem would be crossing a big line, a very dangerous line, into territory that most would feel very unsafe in making such a proclamation. You see, the point being, it's much easier to say those cries outside of the city of Hosanna than it is inside the occupied city of Jerusalem. No doubt, if you know, the, the Roman, the occupiers of that city, the Roman government would feel very much at ease, uh, ill at ease, I should say, um, to hear such cries, as well as the religious officials would be threatened by them. And the city is already on edge. You see, not just because Jesus, the, the, the one who crosses all these lines, is coming in. No, no, but his presence right there in this moment does ramp up the anxiety level of the city. 
That's because the city is now filled with worshipers from all over the region who have come to celebrate the Passover, a ritual, an annual ritual celebration that recalls the way God freed the Israelites from their, from their Egyptian captors. It's kind of like their 4th of July, and that makes the whole city on edge. And Jesus' arrival just adds to the edginess. It's, it, it, the whole city now is asking, who, who is this? And, 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 and to possibly even lower the anxiety level somewhat, some in the crowd answer this. They say, this is Jesus, he, a prophet from Nazareth in the Galilee. And church, that could be construed as a put-down of sorts. It's a, you need to remember that in John chapter 1, verse 46, when Philip introduced Jesus to Nathanael as the one Moses wrote in the law about, from Nazareth, he said, the son of Joseph, Nathanael replied, Nazareth? What good? What good has ever come out of Nazareth? Meaning that the predominant thinking church in this particular time of the religious community in particular was that Nazareth was not a region that God would ever choose to send a Messiah from. So with that statement, those inside the city are making Jesus to be out more like a troublemaker, you know, um, a prophet maybe, like his cousin John. And, and, and maybe they're possibly hoping he's just going to pass through and, and, and withdraw to the world in, in some desert setting. But <laughs> it's not like Jesus didn't go out of his way to identify who he was. If you read ahead for the next five days, Jesus will do quite a bit to show exactly who he was. He'll cross such lines as entering into the temple on the very next day, becoming upset with what he sees as the custom of doing business as usual with the money changers. He'll then overturn those tables, driving the money changers out, saying, my house will be called a house of prayer. Now, the driving out of the temple, <laughs> that, that's one thing. That's big. That, that challenges the authority. But when Jesus referred to the temple as his house, that's another huge line he just crossed. And next, Jesus heals the blind and the lame inside the temple. Church, that's another line he just crossed because the blind and the lame are not allowed or supposed to be in the temple by Jewish law. You know, I used to think, that the reason why the public opinion or the tide of public opinion turned so radically against Jesus from the cries on, of save us on Sunday to the cries of crucify him on Friday was because the people didn't really understand who Jesus truly was. The truth is, church, if they were paying attention to what Jesus' ministry looked like in the outside world, outside of Jerusalem, that is, they would have clearly seen what kind of Messiah he truly was. But to me, this rapid crossing of lines makes it clear, to me, exactly who Jesus is. But the religious people didn't want a Messiah. No, they didn't want one who would confront them, not at all. Instead, they wanted a military leader, one God would send to rid them of their Roman occupiers with, with all their strict regulations and taxes, which were an abomination to the, to the Jewish government. Possibly they were hoping maybe these Jewish officials that Jesus would just play nice with them, stop crossing all these different lines, like saying things like he's God, and just get busy organizing an army, and then the bloodshed can begin. But that thinking, church, all ended in chapter 22, when answering a question posed by the Pharisees of whether or not to pay taxes to Caesar. You see, Jesus crosses that line by telling them to pay the taxes, <laughs> proving he's not a militant. He's not a militant leader that they expected. And, and then when confronted with the question of, of, of what Jesus believes to be the greatest commandment of them all, he shows he's more of a lover than a fighter when he replies to love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. The law, he says, and all of the prophets hang on these two commandments. 
See, church, and that was a line Jesus never wanted crossed, the line of love. But the religious officials, well, they were not alone in their misconception of Jesus. No, I believe the Roman government was also, they thought they had Jesus all figured out as well. But to them, Jesus was just another troublemaker, you know, another wannabe Messiah in a long list of wannabe Messiahs, all who were crucified prior to this by Pontius Pilate. But they were smart enough to know he was no terrorist. And even Pilate says he crossed no lines that deserve being crucified for. But then Pilate asked this question. He said, Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Now, just for a second, maybe, just maybe, if Jesus doesn't cross that line, maybe decides to play nice with the Roman government, I don't know, maybe, maybe just maybe Pilate will give him Herod's job. Regardless, see, all of humanity for eternity hangs in the balance of how Jesus will answer that question. When he has asked, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answers, it is as you say. And I want to say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. See, the, every year it seems like the question on Palm Sunday always comes down to, you know, why did the tide turn so quickly against Jesus? And I believe the reason is the people were all over the place, the Jewish people in particular, with their alliances. You see, some were aligned with the Pharisees and some were aligned with the Sadducees, and others were still aligned with the Herodians. And, and they were described in, in Mark chapter 6 at verse 34 as being sheep without a shepherd, wandering all over the place, living in fear as a divided bunch uh, under this oppressive Roman rule. And the one claiming to be the Messiah just doesn't fit their template of who the Messiah should be. Because all Jesus talks about is forgiveness, loving your enemy, giving up your cloak. These aren't things they want to hear. They, they wanted a, a Messiah who would lead an insurrection so they could gain their freedom from their Roman captors. And that was a line church Jesus would never cross, ever. The truth is they had no idea. They had no idea that the plan was from God that to set them free from the slavery of sin and to also give them, and also to, sleep, to free them from the sin, free them from the fear of their physical deaths. You see, church, Jesus didn't come to lead an insurrection. He came to give us a resurrection. And that's what he tried to show them. And that's what he tried to tell them. We see, the only way to overcome this or any dire situation you're in the midst of was with an outpouring of love. It's the only way to overcome it. Yet because of their fear, they just couldn't cross that line with him on that particular day. It was way safer for them to stay on the sidelines for now. But we know that will change on Easter Sunday. See, right now in our country, there are many crying out. There are many crying out in fear to be saved from this virus. Some are crying out to Jesus to save them. And church, I'm going to tell you, this is no time to stand on the sidelines in fear and act like, a, like sheep without a shepherd. Church, we are all in this together. You know, and I believe the great shepherd, Jesus Christ, wants us to pull all of our available resources together to fight this invisible enemy of ours that is, that is basically not a time to cower and to stay on the sideline in fear. The question is for those who are able, physically and financially, while taking all the precautions that you can, 
Are you willing, this is the question, are you willing to cross that line and give all the help you can to eradicate this enemy? Because right now, the, the world needs a great outpouring of love. And there are things we can do great and small, given the, given the limitations even of, 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 you know, of the, what is in front of us. We cannot hoard. We can, we can do our best when we shop, thinking of others and not, not taking everything off the shelf. That's just some of the small things. You see, it, to overcome the fear of this vi virus that's occupying the world, we need to show unity against it. We need to show unity that we are guided by a loving Savior who not only cares for our souls, but he cares for our lives and well as the lives of everyone else who would be affected by this. And so, if you're someone who is fearing, filled with fear right now, or feeling a great deal of fear right now, I'm going to ask that you would allow Jesus to cross the line into your heart and into your life. Because it's as written in 1 John chapter 4 and 18, it says, Perfect love casts out fear. I'm going to close with this statement. There was a classic novel written a number of years ago called The Robe, and in it there's a character named Marcellus, who's become absolutely captivated by Jesus. In his letters to his fiancée in Rome, Diana, he describes to her in intimate detail about Jesus' teachings, about his miracles, and about his crucifixion, and about his resurrection. And finally, he informs her that he has decided to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, in her response, Diana writes, what I feared was, this might affect you in that way. It's a beautiful story, she says. Just let it remain so. We don't have to do anything about it, do we? To which I'll add, Oh, yes, we do. Let's pray. Lord, give us the strength and the opportunity to overcome our fear, remaining on the sidelines in any way that we can give our support. Allow the, 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 the faith that we claim, Lord God, to empower us to do things, Lord God, that would help us to step out of our comfort levels, but yet remaining safe not taking any unreasonable risks that would cause us to either spread this disease or to contract it ourselves. Lord, help us to reach out to one another in this particular time and to not, and to not be reluctant to do so. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.